it's going to be a wild ride as we get into Psalm 90 today. Psalm 90 is the oldest psalm written in all of the psalms. Oldest one. Out of 150, Psalm 90 is the oldest one. It's authored by a prayer of Moses, the man of God. So this is a very important passage. It's written by Moses. Now, Moses had a special relationship with God. I mean, so special. God forgave him of murder, okay? Why do we got all these people who are murderers right in the Bible, right? <laughs> David, Paul, I mean, all these people were, were guilty of some heinous things that God forgave. Not only that, God revealed himself and said, I'm going to use you to establish Israel as a nation, and it's going to be my people. God said, out of all the nations of the earth, this people is going to be in my inheritance. And he said, Moses, I'm going to use you to do it. Moses wrote the whole law, the whole thing. The first five books of the Bible written by Moses. Genesis. I mean, Moses is sitting there in the tent of meeting, and God is telling Moses everything. He said, Moses, I want you to say, in the beginning, God. Think about this. Moses had this close relationship with God. He is known as the man of God. What an amazing thing. And he had a relationship with God. Moses, so important in human history and our relationship with God that at the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew 17, guess who's there? Moses and Elijah. Guess what? God wanted Moses' body so that he could use him to be an end-time prophet. Did you know that at the end of time, right during the tribulation, that Moses and Elijah are going to be the two uh, testimonies that are going to come and testify to the world? Moses had such a deep relationship, and this is the psalm that Moses wrote. This is his prayer. I want you to lean in here because I got excited about Psalm 90, and I believe that you will as well. Let's read it together. Lord, You have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or you had ever formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You return man to dust and say, return, O children of man. For a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past, or a watch in the night. You sweep them away as with a flood. They are like a dream, like the grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning, it flourishes and is renewed. In in the evening, it fades and withers. For we are brought to an end by your anger. By your wrath, we are dismayed. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. For all our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. The years of our life are 70 or or even by reason of strength, 80. Yet the span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? So... Teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. We've entitled today's message, Teach Us to Number Our Days. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we present ourselves to you as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to you. This is our spiritual worship today. Would you speak to us over the next few moments? Would you use me as a vessel to communicate your truth And God, that your name would be glorified and that Jesus, you would be seen and heard. Holy Spirit, reveal your word to us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So many of you know I went on this bicycle ride. I know you keep hearing about it, but a lot happened, okay? And it keeps happening, okay? I rode my bicycle from the west side of Iowa at the Missouri River, rode it all the way across, 510 miles across the state, seven days Three of those days, I was riding 80-plus miles a day on a bicycle, 
pedaling on a bicycle up and down hills. No, Iowa is not flat. We ended in Davenport at the Mississippi River, and it was strenuous. So much so that most of the time, which I was riding five to seven hours of straight pedaling per day, okay? That's like a a full-time job, just pedaling, okay? Just cranking it out, just pedaling, clipped into the pedals, just cranking it out, had a blast. It was challenging. It was hard. Would I do it again? Probably not, but it was fun, okay? Had a good time. Well, I got a notification from my watch this week because I have one of these smart watches that reads your heart rate, and it told me that over the last 20 days since I rode my bicycle, my walking heart rate has decreased from 109 beats per minute down to 95 beats per minute. What that means is the cardio that I did on this bicycle ride for seven days got my heart in a much healthier state because it had been going through this training and pumping and working to now afterwards I'm feeling the effects And my body is saying, hey, we're going to be walking and we're not even going to have to pump as hard as we used to because my cardiovascular system got such a, I guess, a clean out of some sort that was happening through all of this training. Now, listen, when we read Psalm 90, it is like a training for your spiritual heartbeat in order to get you into a state where you're going to be more healthy to walk with Jesus for a long time to come. You're going to see that the beats per minute of your spiritual life is reduced and you're in a healthier state than you've ever been before. Because Moses, the man of God, is teaching us to Number our days so that we can gain a heart, a heart of wisdom. Listen, God wants to do that in your life today. He wants to give you an understanding of how you can truly walk closer with God. What I love about this psalm is it pulls our focus away from ourselves and it pushes our focus on God. Did you know that that's one of the biggest struggles? Jesus says, in order to follow me, you must deny yourself daily, take up your cross, and follow me. So denying ourselves, getting our eyes and our focus off of ourselves is one of the greatest challenges in the Christian life because you and I live in our own bodies. Our souls consume our thoughts every waking minute of the day. And what Moses does here is he pushes our focus onto God and he starts by saying he's from everlasting to everlasting. He pulls our focus off of ourselves and he puts our focus on God's eternal nature. And he starts out and he says, God, you've been our dwelling place from generation to generation. You've been our dwelling place. The word used there to speak of dwelling place is a word that describes either an animal's den or home, or it means the foundation and the, the place where God lives. But it does never, it never is used to describe a human dwelling place. What that means is that the place that we go to in God, it's like a refuge. A refuge is a place where you go and take shelter from everything that's happening. I believe that God is a great refuge. We can find refuge in God's great and eternal nature. From everlasting to everlasting, you can run into that because he's eternal. He's existed forever. When God was revealing himself to Moses, he said, when the people ask what your name is, it says, Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said, say to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. That's God's eternal nature. He's always existed. He has been there from everlasting to everlasting. I said it last week. God started the clock of time. God exists both in time and around time. He knows the end from the beginning. The book of Revelation says that Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. That's the A and the Z of the Greek alphabet. It's everything in between. God is eternal, and we can find refuge and shelter in God's eternal nature. And in verse 2, he says, before the mountains were brought forth, He says, before the earth was formed, before there was anything, I am. Before the mountains were brought forth, or you ever formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are 
God. Everlasting means that God's nature is perpetual. It exists. It will always exist. And you and I can take refuge in who God is. We can get to know him because Moses, the man of God, is saying things about him that he discovered in this deep relationship. Going on to verse 3, he says, you return man to dust. You return man to dust. Remember that Moses wrote Genesis. He wrote the creation experience. He wrote the fact that God formed man out of the dust of the earth. And he records it in Genesis chapter 2. He says this. Yes, Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living creature. And then when the curse of sin came and God's dealing out the punishment that's going to happen, it says in Genesis 3.19, By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. God is saying, now death has come into the world because of sin, and you're going to return to the ground and become dust once again. What's really interesting about this is that when Moses writes in Genesis and uses the word dust, it literally means the earth, the, the dirt of the earth. But the word that he uses in Psalm 90 is a different word. Why would Moses, the same guy who wrote Genesis, why would he use a different word for dust? I believe it's in what the word actually means. Going back to in Psalm 90, verse 3, you return man to dust. Notice he says, you return man to dust. What did he say in Genesis? He said, and dust you shall return. So he's referencing the fall of man here. He's referencing the punishment that came on the human race because of sin. He's saying return to dust. Very important that he's doing that. But once again, the word dust is different. This is the word daka, and it's First definition is adjective, which this is not an adjective because you return man to dust. It's a noun. We're going to get to that in a second. But the first definition is to be contrite, those who are crushed. The second is a noun, dust, as pulverized. So it's like life. What he's saying is he's saying we have to number our days because life comes at us and it pulverizes us back to that original state that we were in. Some of you can testify in this place that life has tried to pulverize you through all of its heavy things that have come after us, and it hurts. Why do we need to have refuge in God? Because life is really hard. If you look further into the definition of DACA, the word, the, the adjective crushed is pertaining to damaging a part of the body by destructive pressing or blow. It also means, the adjective contrite, pertaining to an attitude of penance or humility. That I'm repentant, I'm realizing how it's crushed me. Despondent, the adjective, pertaining to the attitude or emotion of distress. And then dust, the noun, a fine powdered earth as a natural substance. So what he's saying is he's using a different word for dust because he's trying to communicate what you're going to experience in this life. Because remember, he's writing Psalm 90 at the end of his life after 40 years of leading a rebellious people through a wilderness and they wandered around aimlessly because they disobeyed God. And he's looking back at it all, and his prayer later, we're not going to read it today, but I encourage you to go after verse 12. It goes all the way to verse 17. He's, he's praying that God would restore them again. He says, yes, Lord, establish the work of our hands. He says, I believe you have purpose for us still. There's hope around the corner. But, but the idea that he's saying is, I've seen so much pain in this life. I've witnessed so much. I've led God's people. I've established the law. I've seen their rebellion. I've seen them take a gold calf and bow down and worship it. I've seen it all. And after everything, I feel like life just comes to crush me and to make it to beyond what I can even do for myself. This psalm, it echoes God's message of his powerful and eternal nature and it contrasts about our frailty and the brevity of our humanity. It says in verse 4 through 6, For a thousand years in your sight 
are but as yesterday when it is past, or a watch in the night. He, you sweep them away. What do you sweep away? You sweep away a thousand years like a flood. They are like a dream. Another word for dream is sleep. It's, it's, like, it's like you wake up. It's just like, boom, thousand years, over, just like that, just while you sleep. Like the grass that is renewed in the morning. He says these thousand years, they're like the grass. And what's he doing? He's out in the wilderness. He's out in the desert. He gets to see the grass that's new in the morning. And then the heat of the day just completely zaps all of this grass. And it begins to wither. And once again at night, it comes back to life again. In the morning, it's renewed. And he says, a thousand years are just like that. What you and I have to understand is all the toil and things that we worry and stress about. Jesus says, don't worry for tomorrow, for tomorrow has enough worries of its own. And yet we sit here and do this. And God says, thousand years, thousand years, thousand years. They're like nothing. They're like a dream. They're like nothing. It's, it's amazing. The, the word sweep it means to be washed away. Just, just sweep, wash them away. In James chapter 4 and verse 14, James gives us a clear perspective from a New Testament mindset. And he says this in verse 14. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? What a great question. And he answers it. For you are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. What he's referencing here is if you've ever seen when you go in the morning sometimes and the ground temperature is different than the air temperature and there's a great fog that's hanging over a lake or a field and it's just a mist. By the time the sun gets up, that thing is gone. What you and I have to remember is we are but a mist. Moses is saying today, he's saying, number your days. Take account of what your life really is and what you're living for. What are you striving for? All of it is going to come to nothing. And none of us is guaranteed tomorrow. I had an opportunity to go to a funeral yesterday for a 23-year-old woman. She attended my small group, studying the book of Romans for about a year and a half. Wonderful, wonderful, spirit-filled young woman. Tragically passed away room full of people. She was of Ghanaian descent and all of the Ghanaian people at the church. I mean, the funeral, guys, if you've not been to a Ghanaian funeral, you need to because the honor that's there and the support that they offer to one another and the praise of God in the room, they started out with worship and they said, why do we worship? Because whether, whether he's good or whether it appears that something difficult, he will be praised, God will be praised. They worship, they praised him. But we all sat there and we looked at this girl who was born just 23 years ago. And if you haven't been to a funeral recently, you need to. Why? Because you need to come face to face with this reality that death is right there. It's right around the corner. You're a mist. You you, you appear and then you vanish. And if if you don't understand it, it's it's repeat throughout the Bible. It goes on and on and on and on about the shortness of the lives that we live. But if we don't come to terms with what's going to happen after this life, we could find ourselves following some really, really messed up ways to process life. There's a group of famous last words that I think that you need to really study. And I had Brother Dennis Murray right over here send me an email this week and shared some of this with me. And I pulled some of it from because it was just fantastic information. There was a man named Thomas Paine. And he was uh, an early American philosopher. He wrote the book, The Age of Reason, which made many, many people become atheists and lose their faith in God. And while he was on his deathbed, this is what's recorded about him. He said, stay with me for God's sake. I cannot bear to be left alone. Oh, Lord, help me. Oh, God, what have I done to suffer so much? What will become of me hereafter? I would give worlds if I had them, that the age of reason had never been published. Oh, Lord, help me. Christ, help me. No, don't leave. Stay with me. Send even a child to stay with me, for I am on the edge of hell here alone. If ever the devil had an agent, I have been that one. 
Voltaire, he was a famous French philosopher. He said, I have, I have swallowed nothing but smoke. I have intoxicated myself with the incense that turned my head. I am abandoned by God and man. Then he said to his physician, I will give you half of what I'm worth if you will give me six months of life. When he was told this was not possible, he said, then I shall die and go to hell. His nurse said, for all the money in Europe, I wouldn't want to see another unbeliever die. All night long, he cried for forgiveness. Anton LaVey, who was the uh, writer of the uh, um, Satanic Bible, and he was a high priest in the Satanic Church. Oh my, oh my, what have I done? There is something very wrong. There is something very wrong. I want you to contrast that with, or no, actually, let me go to the words of Jesus in Luke chapter 16. He says, there was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am in anguish in this flame but Abraham said child remember that in your lifetime you received your good things and Lazarus like manner had bad things but now he is comforted here and you are in anguish and besides all this between us and you a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. And he said, then I beg you, Father, send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And then he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And he said to them, this is the point of the parable here. If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced that someone should rise from the dead. The point of the parable is not about hell and torment and rich people and poor people and all this kind of stuff. The point of it is you have to hear God's word, convict you of sin, and repent while you have the time. Because the time is coming when you will be too late and you need to repent and believe that Jesus will forgive your sins right now. We contrast these last words of some of these evil people with some last words of some righteous people. And I want you to see the contrast here. Now, when they heard these things, this is Stephen here in the book of Acts. They were enraged and they ground their teeth at Stephen. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed all together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. Not the dispensary type of stoning. This is rocks pummeling this man until he dies. Then they... And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, look at these last words, Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Isn't that wonderful? Such a righteous way to die. Stephen, the first martyr of the church, losing his life for faith and preaching in the name of Jesus and he sees Jesus welcome him. And the, the scripture says that Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. And yet, Stephen saw him standing. It's like Jesus is giving him a standing ovation, saying, I got you, I got you, I got you. And he says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Did you know that as a believer, you can have a confident assurance of the hope that you have, that eternity is sealed, that you have your name written in the Lamb's book of life, that you can have confidence even in the face of death. Not only that, as we see the last words here of Paul, 
He says, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous God, God will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Isn't that wonderful? These are these powerful last words that God gives to his people so that we know exactly how we ought to live our lives. And so we go back to Psalm 90 here. We're moving on past the brevity of life, and we're moving into this portion where he really talks about some difficult stuff that he's seen in his lifetime. Psalm 97 through 12. For we are brought to an end by your anger. By your wrath, we are dismayed. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. For all our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. Notice it says our secret sins in the light of your presence. The things that you think that you're hiding from God, you're not. You might as well confess them and get them out in the open before God and say, God, I'm confessing my sins to you. Remember, Moses is writing this at the end of a 40-year period of the wilderness. He's seen the anger of the Lord. He's seen God's wrath open up the earth and swallow people who were in Korah's rebellion. He's seen all of these things happen with his very eyes, and he's warning us, God is real. His judgment is real. It is sure that it's going to happen. You need to be covered by the blood of Jesus. He goes on to say in verse 10, the years of our life are 70 or even by reason of strength, 80. Now, Moses led to, lived to 120. He's not saying that the most you can live is 80. He's saying this is the average span of a human lifetime. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. That's how, that's how life right here, he sums it up. 70, 80 years, toil and trouble. They are soon gone and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? And he says, so teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. I want to sit down in this idea for just a moment as we're going to conclude just very shortly. We're going to sit down to teach us to number our days. C.S. Lewis wrote this right here. He said, in the end, that face, which is the delight or the terror of the universe, must be turned upon each of us, either conferring glory inexpressible or inflicting shame that can never be cured or disguised. Each of us have to come to that face. The writer of Hebrews says, and just as it is appointed for man to die once, and then after that comes the judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Jesus is coming to rescue us. So we live in this span of toil and trouble. What are we going to do with our 70 to 80 to 120 years? What are, what are we going to do? We're going to number our days so we can have a heart of wisdom. Thomas Times said it like this. Of all the arithmetical rules, this is the hardest to number our days. Men can number their herds and droves of oxen and of sheep. They can estimate the revenues of their manors and farms. They can, with little pains, number and tell their coins. And yet, they are persuaded that their days are infinite and innumerable, and therefore, never begin to number them. I know it feels like you're going to live forever, <laughs> doesn't it? It just feels like the end is never really going to come. I assure you, the one business that will always be open doors is a funeral home. <laughs> You're all going to die. I'm going to die. We must number our days so that we can gain a heart of wisdom. Perhaps nowhere in all of the Bible other than Psalm 90 and Ecclesiastes chapter 12 is death referenced with such clarity, with, with, with just such... Listen to, listen to what Solomon writes in Ecclesiastes 12. Remember also your creator in the days of your youth. Before the evil days come and the years draw near, of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. 
before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened and the clouds return after the rain, in the day when the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men are bent and the grinders cease because they are few and those who look through the windows are dim and the, on the doors of the street are shut and when the sound of the grinding is low and one rises up at the sound of a bird and all the daughters of song are brought low, they are afraid also of what is high and terrors are in the way. The almond tree blossoms, the grasshopper drags itself along, and desire fails because man is going to his eternal home, and the mourners go about the streets. Before the silver cord is snapped, or the golden bowl is broken, or the pitcher is shattered at the fountain, or the wheel is broken at the cistern, and the dust, come on, returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. Why does the Bible talk so much about death? Because if you and I aren't careful, we won't number our days. We'll just go on about it thinking I've got it. I've got time. I remember as a young man, mom and dad brought me to church every week. Why did I go astray? Why did I do my own things? Because I said, I've got time. (laughs) I've got more time. I'll do that later. Friend, you may not have tomorrow. And if I'm a good preacher of God's word, I'll tell you the whole counsel. And I know it's been heavy today, but I want to make sure that you and I are looking at our lives rightly, that we see ourselves as a mist. We see ourselves as, as years that are gone, thousand years swept away and see ourselves standing before Almighty God and saying, what are you going to do with this life to glorify me? That's what he says. Teach us to number our days so that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Tremper Longman III said it like this. He, which is Moses, does not want us to live, does not want to live as though he will live forever, but rather in the knowledge of his mortality. Why? To have a heart of wisdom. Wisdom is the ability to live life in an authentic way. The wise person knows how to make the right choices at the right time. Gain a heart of wisdom. Number our days so we can gain a heart of wisdom. Here's how I want to transition the message to the end here, okay? Because I know we've been in in some pretty heavy stuff, okay? Let's step out of all of that with with knowing all that we've just shared. And let's step into this idea that I'm going to begin to number my days today. And from here forth, and that I'm going to gain a heart of wisdom. I'm going to act in an authentic way, and I'm going to know what to do at the right time because I'm numbering my days, I'm using my time wisely, and I'm thinking about everything that's in front of me. Paul says it like this, and this is how I want to close. He says, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. It's just such a powerful verse, okay? Now get this. Right after that, he says, therefore. Why? Why is therefore? Therefore, because of what we just read. That we have victory over death. We don't have to worry about death. Death is taken care of. God's given us victory through Christ Jesus our Lord. He has defeated death on our behalf, okay? Now, therefore, since you ain't got to worry about dying because everything's taken care of, he says, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. What does it mean to have a heart of wisdom in numbering our days? It means getting busy doing what God has called you to do. He says, now that death is taken care of, now you don't have to worry about all that stuff. Now get busy. So let me tell you how you can do that. How are you going to work in the Lord? Okay? You're going to go to the growth track. You're going to get involved in a dream team. You're going to start serving people. You're going to start being a witness, a bold witness on your job, on your workplace, on, on your school. You're, you're going to be a bold witness in your family gatherings. You're going to tell people, hey, this is not all that there is. In fact, there's a whole lot more on the other side. Here it's just a, a mist. Yeah. On the other side, it's eternity. And you work for the Lord. Get involved 
interrupting God's work. Why do we gather every week? Because we want to tell our community there's hope. Oh, man, when they say on the news, I saw it this week, COVID's back on the rise. People are like, what now? They want you to get another shot. I'm saying people need hope right now. They need hope. You are working for the Lord. Your labor for the Lord is not in vain. Work for him. Do things for him. Glorify him. Love him. I hope that you've been encouraged today. Let me me pray as we close today. Father, I know that there may be some here today that are facing the reality that they're, they're... earthly existence is temporary. It's a tent that we live in now and that we will be given a home to dwell in forever. Father, I pray, God, that you'd make us come aware of the areas where we need to repent and follow you. In fact, maybe you're here today under the sound of my voice and right now in the presence of the Lord, you know I'm not right with God and that if I died today, I don't know what would happen, but I want to have a confidence That if I die, or when I die, that I'm going to be forever with the Lord. If that's you here today, and you want to repent of your sin and believe that Jesus can forgive you of your sin and give you eternal life, I want you to do something bold. On the count of three, I want you to lift up your hand all across this room. One, two, three. All across this room, just lift up your hand. Yes. 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 Any hands. You can put them right back down. Maybe you're online. You can respond to this as well. I'm going to pray a prayer right now. Lifting your hand did not save you. This prayer, it doesn't save you. Jesus giving you his Holy Spirit saves you and marks you so that you have eternity in your heart that Jesus lives inside of you. And you have to invite him from the bottom of your heart. I want you to all pray this prayer out loud after me. Pray really boldly. Say, dear Jesus, I believe you're the son of God that you died for my sin, that you rose from the dead, and that you live today. And you can give me new life. You can forgive my sin, and you can give me eternity. I believe that you are Lord. Come and be my Savior and give me new life. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Can we celebrate God in this place today?